Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk. It's always a pleasure to be back here in Silicon Valley. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit more about financial inclusion uh, in the space of decentralization. And I think my uh, purpose today is to share with you what is happening in Asia and how decentralization can help Asia to grow by inclusion rather than by growing by debt, which is what is happening all the time. And if you look at all the logo that I have, I wear many, many hats. Um, at the bottom here, I'm actually, I actually work half the time in universities. And my job is to be in charge of the FinTech and blockchain group and to, re to revise the entire syllabus so that our students will be able to get a job, especially the finance students. And a lot of our courses has actually now uh, fintech and blockchain based so a finance course is very different from when I was a student now most of the time uh, the students will have to learn about programming uh, and also new subjects like uh, fintech cryptography and also uh, I call it the fintech engineering which is what I'm talking about today and you're talking about fintech engineering you can see that I have to cheap put there as minimizing cost of trust and actually my maximizing the cost of hacking. That is something that uh, some of these courses that we are teaching to see how do you design blockchain system when you go off chain. Because for financial inclusion, it is not just an on chain problem. It is also an off chain problem. And to solve the last mile problem is very diff different from just looking at the design of the network itself. You need to look at every point um, especially any point of attack uh, by hackers or if there's any single point of failure that we have to worry about. That's, that's my job as SUSS. And then I spend the other half the time at Block Asset. Um, we are an investment um, company that invests purely on blockchain projects uh, that belongs to a group called Genesis Finance dot network. Um, we have a few uh, partners there and it's based in Shanghai and we have four funds. Block Asset is just one fund that focuses on financial inclusion and decentralized technology. We have Fambushi Capital, uh, we have Fambushi Digital and we have BK Fund and I'm, I'm not too sure whether you heard about them but basically what we have done is to invest in a lot of projects to ensure that we build an ecosystem for decentralization not only on-chain but to go off-chain as well because that is where the demand and, the, and especially the future demand is. So, and of course I have other hat that I wear. I see it on a couple of government com committees in Singapore. We have the Infocom uh, Development Authority that we look at blockchain standard. Uh, we look, I see it on the working group with the government also looking at um, combining AI, blockchain and big data to move Singapore forward to serve ASEAN in, in, uh, in the space of uh, financial inclusion because Singapore, uh, including the central bank, which is called Monetary Authority of Singapore, focuses on using technology to serve the underserved in the region. And I'll tell you why that is important going forward. Okay, and I, I was also let you uh, share with you why um, I'm, I'm talking about financial inclusion today. So, well, I suppose not many of you know who he is. Um, well, um, I think in the last few days there's been a lot of talk online and Vitalik has actually been talking about plasma sharding and about layer 2 solutions. Layer 1 and layer 2. I'm not going to talk about the technical today but what is important if you look at what he was talking about was the trade-off bet between layer 1 and layer 2. And in the particular focus that he has is about governance, layer one governance. Because you can't spend a lot of time talking about governance at layer one each time you have an innovation. It's best to do the innovation at level two to minimize the governance cost. Because the cost of governance is very high at the base layer. So this is what he has been thinking about. How do we reduce the cost of trust 
at the, at the base layer, but at the same time, you can experiment with innovation in the second layer. And that was what he was talking about in terms of sharding, plasma, plasma cache, and so on. So this is what is on his mind. And at the same time, if you look at most of the cytopunk tweeting in on, online, this is what they're concerned about. They're concerned about the single point of attack, whether it's geographically, whether there is a network single point of attack, or if there's any other way that you can prevent that from happening. So Nick Zabo has actually tweet Twitter some time ago to say that some of this design that you have are having a lot of discussion and there are disputes about where these weak points are, especially about decentralization. And remember, decentralization is not a static con concept. Decentralization is a dynamic concept. Something which is decentralized today, if you're not careful and it converges towards a few points with better endowment, then you are actually moving towards centralization and you're less decentralized than the day before. So decentralization is a very important dynamic concept that we have to grasp. And with that, Nick in 20, 2001, way before Bitcoin was invented, he has written something which is very interesting. He's talked about trusted third party. He talked about trusted computing base controlled by a third party to constitute the introduction of a security hole into that design. And that was seven years before blockchain white paper was written. And today, this is still very relevant in the sense that where is the trusted third party or whether it is 100% trustless network. And there's no such thing as a 100% trustless network. That is important to realize. No matter what it is, there will be some centralization. Whether it's governance or whether people with better knowledge and acting as developer or core developer for the entire network. So there will be some centralization somewhere. And the job of us in the decentralized world is to minimize all this point of weakness. And it is a continuous effort. It is not static. And this is why we have to understand what Nick has written many years ago. And he revisited what he has written in 2001, in 2017, talking about an unending variety of topics uh, that he has for money, blockchains, and social scalability. An idea about social scalability is important because the entire world, developers and cypherpunks, were focusing on increasing scalability through faster, better, and cheaper way. And one of those is to have faster TPS, transaction per second. And Nick argues that that is not something that we may want to focus on because the centralized system is always more efficient. And there is a very good reason why decentralized system is a very inefficient ledger. So what's the use of a very inefficient ledger? as compared to the centralized system. And this is what this paper that he has written about. Refocusing on certain areas, and which is the talk today, is about what is a trustless system? Okay. How do we minimize trust? Trust minimization is what decentralization is about. And at the same time, if you look at this paper in 2017, there is another very important point. And those of you who are familiar with Singapore, we have millions of data points been stolen from our health system. And this is security. You have to increase the cost of hacking, but at the same time, reduce the inconvenience cost to the user. And this is what decentralization is about. Decentralization is not about having a larger number of transactions per second it is not about having a more efficient way of storage. These are taken to be inefficient. The main thing about decentralization is about security, is about privacy. And you make it as inefficient as possible. 
so that the cost of hacking is so high that it will look for other target, targets rather than a decentralized system. And at the same time, every point of attack that you can identify, you want to minimize trust as far as possible because the cost of trust is very high, especially it involves human behavior. And this is what the whole tokenization world is about. So if you don't get that right, we will, we will not have the right design when we go off chain. Because when we go off chain, it's about inclusiveness. It is not only about financial inclusion, it's about technical inclusion. It is not about open blockchain working on its own. It's about open, open blockchain working with private blockchain. And when you do that, smart contract comes into the picture, atomic transfer comes into the picture, and this is where the technology can do the most impact on humanity. And this is basically what the paper of Nick Zabo was talking about, and it's worth a read. And this is what the talk is about today. So this is what we talk about why Bitcoin is successful. It's not because we can a higher number of TPS. It is because it's about privacy as well as reducing, uh, minimization, minimizing trust. Only if you minimize trust, only if you, you maximize the cost to hacker, then you can have social scalability. Okay, this is what the entire thinking is about. It's just not about technical scalability. We have to think about social scalability. And that's what Evelyn was talking about. How do you bring the 70% in the world that is not in our financial and economic system? Because they are the customers that the tokenized world will be servicing. The securitized world will not be able to service the excluded. It's only the tokenized world that can serve the excluded. So this is what it is all about. So technology will solve its own limitation. Don't worry about TPS. Don't worry about storage space. Eventually, technology will solve that problem on its own and you will never be as efficient as a centralized system. We have to take, a, take that as given. Okay? So this is, a, this is about those engineering scalability discipline are not as set by way of contrast with social scalability. I'm happy to pass all these slides to you, so I'm going to go a little bit faster because, because I'm going to talk about only about 30 minutes. So you can see that um, this is what, um, back to Adam Smith, and I think Nick actually quoted Adam Smith. It's about benevolent. The whole idea about token is about incentivize everyone who is a node, incentivize every participant to do a certain action in order to have a good outcome. It is an incent incentive for people to collaborate. This is what a token is about. This is what ETA is about. This is what Bitcoin is about. It is just a way to incentivize people to collaborate so that we can get a good outcome. It doesn't depend on benevolent or the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner but from their regard for their own interest. It is about self-interest so that people will be rewarded by the token in order for a good outcome to be achieved. That is on chain. However, however, the minute you go off chain, the benevolent factor has to come in. Or regulation will have to come in. Or we have to find a way to ensure that people who are excluded are incentivized to join the network in order to be social scalability. So that is where most of the misunderstanding is about why do we need regulation? Why do we need benevolent motives? Because the network itself do not need anyone to be benevolent, the incentive itself would have taken care of that. That is on chain. But once you go off chain, everything is different. You need regulation. You need benevolent agents acting. You need people to collaborate with you, not purely on the token itself. And this is where private blockchain come into the picture. Well, if you look at open blockchain, it is about 
distribute, distributed trust and it has cost issues. How do we delegate trust? How do we minimize trust? Just two things. If you can't minimize trust, you have to delegate trust. So when you delegate trust, there's a cost involved. And this is what it is in terms of just take two types of consensus algorithm. The proof of work is energy cost, depreciation of the equipment as entire ecosystem. The risk is probably low, but there is a danger of hardware concentration. Okay. And the purest form of replacing third party human trust by cryptography. This is POW. And if we move away from that to proof of stake, then it is about how much stake that you have. You have to acquire those stakes. And it's either your time cost or your money cost to acquire those stakes. This is what it is. And the risk is that there is a nothing at stake problem that I can stake anywhere since it's not POW. It doesn't involve many of the hardware costs, electricity costs, because I can stake everywhere. And therefore, there is a possibility of a double spend problem occurring. Though rare, but it's possible. And therefore, there is also an issue of the rich getting richer. Because you have a stake, when you stake it, you'll get more. So it doesn't solve the original problem about justice, about equality, about what the cypherpunk were all thinking about. And this is very important to understand. So this is the second issue that we need to think about. And the, and also the first layer versus the second layer. The first is high governance costs involving human decision. Each time you do a hard fork, you will have instability. And that is very costly. So you want to minimize that. So you move that to the second layer. But moving that to the second layer, you have a centralization risk. Because some, in some cases, you are just acting like a private blockchain. So this is where there is always a trade-off in the design. And all this is about fintech engineering. It's all about design thinking that we are talking about. So, well, open plus permission blockchain is what is going to uh, be interesting. Um, we got to ask ourselves whether it's a better alternative or worse. Okay. Can one increase the number of administrative nodes to dispute trust? A private blockchain can be centralized, but you can continue to give administrative nodes more, more, uh, more nodes to doing administration, and slowly you could dis or gradually you decentralize. That's what you could do. But how costly is decentralizing decision using human judgment? That is the question we have to ask. Governance issue of delegating trust to which nodes and which party. Once you go off the private chain or off chain then you have all this issue that you need to think about. The degree of decentralization and how many points of attack. When you have um, atomic transfer, when you have smart contract, these are all points of attack that we need to think about. Okay. And how to minimize the cost of trust, how to minimize the possibility of single point or few points of attack. And we have cost train, we are using hash time lock smart contract for atomic transfer. And also the risk involving oracles when oracles break down and so on. These are all the fintech engineering design thoughts that we have to think about. And this is what the entire field is about token economy is about. And this is where the next wave, the next big thing about tokenization is about design thinking. Okay, about blockchain. So now I want to bring it to Asia because most of the Asia enterprises are middlemen. They are all small, medium enterprises. They are all facing the fourth industrial revolution. And fortunately, that is where the opportunity for blockchain is. And I think, I think Evelyn has just given you a taste of what it is and I should give you more examples as I go forward. Here, you can see that the profit margin for most of the companies in Asia are going down. The return on equities continue to drop and everyone is being told to transform their company by using digital. And sharing economy with a lot of fintech companies that we see from China doesn't solve the problem that we originally out to solve, which is financial inclusion. China 
has brought 600 million people out of poverty through centralized fintech company. But the minute they start move out of China, they are facing a lot of problems because that is where regulation comes in. No country would like any other centralized fintech company to be a major player in their own market. No one would want to have a centralized mobility app to control the entire transport system. No smart city can be centralized because if it's a centralized smart city, there is a single point of attack and if a terrorist take over this single point of attack, the entire city is actually in the hands of terrorists. So decentralization is the way to go because centralized fintech companies, centralized mobility app, centralized sharing economy without sharing asset leads to concentration of power and wealth and no government will allow that to happen. So Satoshi is right. At the end of the day, we have to have decentralized smart city. We have to have decentralized mobility app then th those are the technology that we are investing in and they have to be decentralized financial inclusion and this is what Evelyn was talking about we have to own our own data because privacy is the most important we have to have our own dignity because privacy will protect the dignity and it's only through decentralization that we could do that and we have to go decentralization because that's the only way to spread the wealth through fractional ownership on the blockchain. So this is the, um, this is what we are talking about. So everybody is competing with each other, and you see that we are growing by leverage. Banks are lending more, okay, or we have more complex products. And when that happens, the regulators will come down even harder. And you can see in the financial sector, most of the financial institutions can't maneuver themselves out of that regulatory trap. And Singapore Central Bank understands that very well and they understand that Singapore has to be decentralized and therefore if you come to Singapore if you come to ASEAN the feeling is totally different the feeling is about how to use decentralized to improve human way of living how do we use decentralized uh, decentralized technology to have an impact on ASEAN <coughs> On Asia, from India to China, we have two over billion to three billion people. How do we use decentralized technology? And regulation will change to accommodate, uh, to accommodate decentralized technology. And that's the difference. So regulation doesn't drive decentralization. Decentralization is driving regulatory changes, at least in Singapore. And this is what you're seeing. So I invite you to come during the FinTech um, Festival Week, which is November 11 to 16, we are expecting 50,000 people in Singapore for the FinTech Festival talking about FinTech and decentralization. And there'll be a one-day decentralization conference in uh, SUSS talking about um, decentralization as well. So this is where everyone is. They're trying to compete with each other and trust is lost and nobody wants to collaborate with each other. And this is what is happening in Asia. So we are jammed. We can't go on within the regulatory system because we can't collaborate. Okay? And you can see that um, what most of the government has done is just continue printing money. And you have seen that that is not working because property prices continue to go up, banks continue to land out, everybody is saddled with debt and they now all, in some ways, are working for the bank for the rest of their life. For their life. And there's a new movement in Japan now called minimization culture. That they don't want anything at all. They, own, they don't own any assets. They don't even have a mop at home to mop the floor. They use any cloth to mop the floor. So the entire philosophy in Japan is changing because they can no more afford the high asset, that, especially housing they need to own. So this is a statistics I want to show you and why decentralization and why Ethereum Foundation can do a job. And 
the only way we can pay back to Ethereum Foundation for block asset for all the good work that Ethereum Foundation has done is to sponsor the forthcoming DEFCON 4 and block asset has decided that we will become a sponsor for DEFCON 4 in Prague so I will see you there but the main thing the message we want to deliver is this 1% population in the world control 50% of the wealth and last year 82% of the wealth generated goes to this 1% and this cannot continue the question is where is the growth coming from because the marginal propensity to consume to this 1% is very low no doubt you have watched the crazy rich Asians and see how they spend their money how they have their helicopters and it's all real they have their own helicopters okay and they have a lot of uh, their own yash and so on it's real but the marginal propensity to consume will never be like the farmers who have to borrow at 100% interest okay so this is where we start so China has started retransforming using ABCD and basic and what what does that mean in China this is very important what is ABCD A is AI B is blockchain C is cloud D is data technology okay a basic is blockchain AI security IOT and cloud and they have been very successful whether it's ping an insurance which makes 100 million roaming people per hour whether it's Alipay and financial whether it's Tencent they are doing very well they are just like the Google um, and, and so on over here in the United States and they, they just go back to basic they look at ABCD okay but the, the whole idea is that there are just too many rules and regulation even all these centralized technology these centralized fintech companies they they reach a point that they can't grow now you see an IPO in Hong Kong for Chinese fintech company on the first day the price will drop it shows you that the growth has reached the maximum so we have to go decentralization okay to go decentralization why because we are focusing on conflict of interest but instead we should be looking at alignment of interest and you know the white paper of satoshi is all about alignment of interest for developer miners investors and users of bitcoin and you can hold all four rows together unlike in the listed company it's all about conflict of interest we bounded but we can go borderless we can have fractional heterogeneous goods and services in other words we can tokenize account things that cannot be securitized cheaply and costlessly we can do it with token we don't need to form a company to own account we can just tokenize the account and we can own account on the blockchain and we can now own 10% of account we don't need to own 100% of account this is what tokenization is about and this is what we are doing in ASEAN okay and it's all about social society benefits so it's about rekindling the spirits in a tightly regulated environment with untrusted peers through the new technology and inclusion and security remains a major issue um, I'm going to skip this the incumbents are very nervous they actually don't they don't need to because the cypherpunk are actually helping them to solve a lot of problem and the regulators in Asia they truly understand that especially in Singapore okay so this is a Chinese word from about me and I and this is one person and you have to put three people together you become cloud a crowd and this is what blockchain is about putting untrusted party together okay this is what it's all about that what we are doing here and untrusted is about collaboration okay and tokens are used to incentivize collaboration to cross border to fractionalize and heterogeneize goods to tokenize things that cannot be securitized okay and then for inclusion okay and 1.0 it was about bitcoin it was about internet of value 2.0 was about ethereum it's about smart contract and 3.0 is the internet of inclusive technology that's why i brought in basic and abcd 
because that is going to happen when we go off chain. We will have to go off chain, but we have to start looking at democratizing mining. We have to start looking onto security issue, privacy, and how to serve the underserved. That is the next big thing. That's blockchain 3.0. Okay, this is where we are. Okay, so it's back to basic. Blockchain is driving ASIC, which is AI, security, IoT, and cloud. Okay, and I'm going to skip all this because at the end of the day, it's about close to zero cost of trust. What we are trying to do is lower cost of trust so that we can cross the border. Okay, so this is what we try to do: improve collaboration and stimulate stimulate entrepreneurship. Okay, it's all about designing good token. Okay, at the end of the day, so let me go here. Let me give some some. Uh, um, there's a paper that's written. I've just written something about how all this ASEAN economy going to leapfrog the financial center because close to 70% of people are not in the financial system from India to China, especially in ASEAN. So I've written a paper to say that all this economy is going to leapfrog because of decentralization, because of user innovation, because it's a bottom-up innovation that bypasses all, all regulation. Let me give some examples of, about that. ATEC. ATEC is, is about remittances, welfare, fair aid, donation, ownership of data and healthcare. You will continue to see this type of project in ASEAN and in the world. And if you are in the, in the area of Ethereum uh, uh, designing, using Ethereum or decentralization, you're going to start focusing on this. Okay? So, you're going to start looking at legal identity and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with POA. A lot of people will start to look at on the Ethereum, Ethereum um, um, framework as well, the POA. Okay. And what is interesting is that these are the market size that we are talking about. Okay. Technology, decentralized technology is just a supply side. You look, you got to look at the demand side and this is the demand side. This is the market. Okay. And more importantly, you can see that you can actually donate, bypass all middlemen to have transparency to people who are actually the beneficiary. And you can actually collect a lot of data if they are willing to share with you what the babies are consuming, what healthcare they need, what medicine they need, and the donors themselves have control over where it's being given. And what is interesting is that you think that government are against token? No, governments are not against ICOs. The Irish government and the Singapore government are involved in tokenization, token generating events. So you can see the Singapore uh, SG Innovate there, which is Singapore Enterprise, part of Singapore Enterprise. And you can see that the Irish Enterprise as well, they are all investing in tokens. So we can see that the government now is part of this a decentralized world that we are talking about. It is no more cypherpunk against the government. Cypherpunk Manifesto 2.0 is about working with people who are willing to work with us so that we can change the world with great impact. That is Cypherpunk 2.0 Manifesto. Okay? At least I believe that to be the case. And this is the count token, Sentinel Chain. You can actually have a chip onto the ear of a cow, onto the blockchain, and on the blockchain, you have the health certificate of the cow, you have the insurance certificate of the cow, and you have the identity of the farmers. So the farmer's reputation is on the blockchain. Okay, the health certificate is there. The insurance company will do a payout if the cow dies, or if the cow disappeared. Okay. And now you have delegated the, the authentication of the data on the blockchain to the insurance company. Because blockchain doesn't ensure that the data is accurate when you go beyond Bitcoin. Only if you delegate the trust to somebody else, like insurance company, who has a stake to ensure the data is authenticated, is verified that the data on the blockchain it's correct, okay? So you need to delegate trust and you need to design in such a way that 
whatever is on the private chain, the data is accurate. And once you have that, it is very interesting. So once you have the livestock identity registration, you have livestock insurance, you have livestock collateralized loan, okay, you have electronic payments, and you have life insurance. It's a very different approach when you go off chain, combining private blockchain and public blockchain. So, okay, last one. So this is what I'm going to end with. You can see that this is private blockchain, with the smart contract to consortium blockchain. And you can put on federated blockchain as well in there. And then you can go to an open blockchain. So this is inclusive blockchain design that you can make use of the best technology that you can have. So it is not the cypherpunk working alone. The government is, way, is actually behind all these projects, okay, using cryptocurrency. And there's a, a lot of other projects like jet trade, okay, which ensure that you can have smart contract to ensure that without your permission, your data is not reviewed. Okay? These are all the usefulness of the blockchain in the real world that's happening in ASEAN. And there are a lot more projects that I can, I can give it to you. So this is very similar to zero knowledge. You can do your big data analysis without access to the data itself. And that is the beauty of blockchain. Because when a big data analysis, people think that I have to have all the data, you have to release all the data. No, with blockchain and smart contract, you don't get to see the data, and yet you can do, do big data query. And that's the beauty of the blockchain technology that we have. Okay, so I'm going to end soon. I, I'm going to pass this to you because there are a lot of mutual aid insurance on blockchain that is happening in Asia. This is what I have, 3C, 5Ds, LASIK, which I don't have time to talk about. You can read about it um, when I give it out. I have, don't have time to talk about stablecoin. There was a question about stablecoin. You need stablecoin. You need stablecoin when you go from on-chain to off-chain. You need that. And there are a lot of different designs to do that. And there's, the latest design is a bond coin and a cash coin. So that the cash coin is stable, the bond coin is volatile. The bond, co the, bond, the bond coin has expiry date, is lightly traded, but the cash coin is heavily traded, but itself is uh, very liquid, as well as that when the price go up, the bond, bond, co the bond coin will convert to increase the supply, so the prices will come down. So there are a lot of design for stable coins just based on smart contracts. And this is already happening in Asia, especially in Singapore. Because Singapore is going to be a center of smart contracts. Because we, it's very interesting that we have a lot of lawyers now learning programming. We have regulators actually, we have regulators coming to university learning uh, zero knowledge, uh, proof and so on. So it's very interesting. Okay, I don't have much time, but I just want to share with you, to let you know that there are a lot happening in ASEAN. A lot happening there. And all these slides I can share with you. Um, this is why it's happening because uh, it's about handphone. Okay, the farmers has got no toilets, no restrooms. They have no electricity except solar panel. They have no utility, but they have a cow. They have a handphone. That is the beauty of ASEAN. So please come to ASEAN if you are a cypherpunk because you are most welcome. Please come to ASEAN. If you are in the you are from the Ethereum space, please come to ASEAN. You will want to do decentralization because that's the where the, that's the place that you will feel most comfortable. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have a few for a couple of questions. I know that there's going to be a, a bunch, but just a few. Yes. So uh, the stable coin. Uh, by design, like, uh, is it uh, very proportional to any uh, particular currency we can uh, match it that for any other live prices, a data of the stable coins, like kind of USD or Euro or like yeah, there's there are many different kinds of stable coins. Some are government backed, some are not, some are commodity backed, some are resource backed. Uh, but the new design is crypto based. So the bond coin and the cash code. I think the future 
will be a mixture. A lot of government are also thinking about their own cryptocurrency, which has nothing to do with the money supply. So a lot of government are designing stable coins based on treasury bills, which have to do with money supply. But there are government who are thinking about bond coin uh, for government back, which has nothing to do with money supply as well. So there is a lot of progress from in that part of the world that the government are looking at cryptocurrency. But in the crypto space where it's purely crypto, I think smart contracts play a major role. And in the case of like countries like Myanmar, you need to have a liquidity pool. So it's a similar thing to USDT, Tether and so on, but with the help of the local government. Because all these government, they do not have a perfect financial system. They, they don't have branches of banks, uh, they, they don't have ATMs, they only have handphones. So they, they really need the crypto people to help them. They really need people to help them. And they're very willing to create a liquidity pool tokenization, working with the insurance association, working with the P2P association to use the local currency to stabilize the coin. So nobody who wants to land out at $100 and then come back as $2 because the cryptocurrency had collapsed. So when they land out $100, they expect the stable coin to come back at 103 or 104 at the end of the year, with 3 to 4 percent. So stable coin is very important once you go off chain. So I remember you asked that question earlier on, and there are a lot of designs going on that. I have some PPT um, on that as well. I can send it to you, but there are many, many different kinds. You can actually over provide with a bigger reserve so that you know, whenever the stable coin is too volatile, by over providing, you can actually supply those coins to dampen the volatility. So there are many, many designs that you could do that. Yeah. Well, thank you again, and I think we're out of time.